Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second of six webinars Fairfield County SCORE is presenting with the Monroe Chamber, the Edith Wheeler Library, and Monroe Economic Development. Today's topic is Sales and Marketing, How to Use Both to Grow Your Small Business. I'm Bud Freund, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at Fairfield County SCORE. I'll be your host today, and our presenter is John Dupree. More on John in just a minute, but first, Beth Stoller has a few words on behalf of our Monroe contingent. Beth? Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I'm Beth Stoller, Operations and Event Manager for the Monroe Chamber. On behalf of the Chamber, the Edith Wheeler Memorial Library, and SCORE, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar, or tonight's webinar. For the last several years, we three organizations have come together to bring you great business-driven topics to help you learn and grow as business professionals. Today, we are pleased to welcome the Monroe Economic Development Commission, as Bud pointed out. They have also joined us with our partnership for this six-week Build Your Business workshop. Late last year, the Economic Development and Chamber sent a survey out to our Monroe businesses asking how we can better assist them as they grow in today's challenging business environment. We asked questions about how you promote your business. What would you like to see in the town? What kind of priorities will help you for future growth? With over 100 replies, we brought this Build Your Business program together. The series began last week and will continue for the next four weeks, alternating between noon and 6 p.m. start times to accommodate everybody's schedule. We are recording these sessions and you can grab a copy of them at the later date, but I know how busy we are. I recommend trying to schedule them once you're done here so that you have them in your calendar. But I will remind you of the website again at the end of this session. The topics that were suggested are what was responded to our survey. Last Thursday, Dr. Ileana Katulik talked about how to turn your setbacks into success. Um, next week, we will continue on the marketing theme and talk about social media, that that's just a part of your marketing pie. And then we also have upcoming webinars about financing options, e-commerce, and lastly, about trusted advisors. So back to today's topic, sales and marketing, how to use them both to grow your small business. We're very lucky to have Speaker John Dupree here today to lay this out for us. John and I have talked several times about this very topic and about how vital it is to learn this as we all build our business marketing platforms. So let me not hold this up any longer. I turn this back to you, Bud, and I'm looking forward to your presentation, John. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Beth. Uh, a few quick things on SCORE, and we'll get to John in just a moment. Um, we're a nonprofit national partner of the Small Business Administration. In Fairfield County, we have over 100 volunteers with a wide range of industry process and subject matter expertise. We offer three primary value-added services. First, we do one-on-one -on -one counseling. Second, we do educational workshops and webinars, over 150 a year. And third, we have extensive resources on our website, including a network of subject matter experts that are at your disposal. Our next live webinar is Tuesday, March 1st at noon, and the topic is Win Customers with Your Website, and Jessica Baldwin will be presenting. You'll find specifics at fairfieldcounty.score.org. Uh, some other useful information. We've set aside time at the end for Q&A, and if you have a question, please put it in the chat window at any time. You'll find a button along the bottom of your screen. Our webinar is going to end sharply at seven to respect your time. And this, as Beth mentioned, the session is being recorded. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, John Dupree. John runs Calibrate Marketing in Danbury, Connecticut. John's experience combines over 20 years in sales and marketing in the B2B world with extensive technological knowledge. He develops marketing strategies for startups and small businesses that improve results and ROI in email, SEO, and search and social media, including in-house mentoring and training. 
He holds an economics degree from Syracuse University and is a certified ISO 9000 auditor. John, it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Bud, Bud and thank you, Beth. So I'm here to talk about sales and marketing in 2022. Um, and I formed this topic because there's been quite a merging uh, that's happened, um, especially after COVID and the work from home and all the changes that happened to our lives. So um, again, my name is John Dupree with Calorie Marketing. And the first thing I'd like to talk is what is marketing? Um, typically it was uh, finding the prospects, finding the people that would have an interest in your products, interest in your services. Really what we wanted to do is we, marketing was to make sales easier. Um, we wanted to make sure the, the audience understood what it was that you were trying to sell. I, um, we would try to make it about them, not about you. So we would talk to them about what their needs were, um, try to find them when they're in their, their point of pain, help qualify their prospect for sales, make sure they had a defined need, had a budget, could spend money, um, that they were able to make a decision, and then try to set the expectations so the prospect would buy. And we did that with creating stories, um, stories that were in the form of commercials or advertisements uh, in the newspaper or magazine, uh, stories that would be told at uh, networking events and such. And they were to educate the prospective audience so they could make informed purchasing decisions. And once they got to that point, we'd kind of throw them over the wall to the sales department. Yeah, it looks like I'm hearing a no sound. Um, can everybody hear me? I can. Okay. okay. Right. Great. So in sales, the whole prospect of sales was to help guide your prospects, uh, to take them from uh, they were, were interested and to guide them through uh, to they were ready to make a purchase. And the sales was really the salesperson um, and what tools and assets that they had. So that salesperson, he would know everything about your product and services or know who uh, who does. And he was the gateway for the uh, prospect to be able to learn more about the products and services and answer their questions. Understood all the differences about uh, you, your company, and the competition. Could explain why you, your company does it the way that, that they do it. It's the unique value proposition. Could explain the value, not just the price. They were the gateway to past clients. Uh, they would introduce people and be able to reference old uh, clients and stories that happened there. They were trusted by friends and associates, They're very easy to do business with, easily would manage the expectations of the, the, the prospect. And one of the biggest things for a good salesperson was that they created trust in that very first meeting. And one of the ways that they created trust is that good salespeople knew that how I represented myself that one time was how I would always be understood for all things. What we would call how you do one thing is how you'll do everything. We also say um, you, know, you can't get a second chance to create a first impression, but uh, what we're really saying is that what somebody picks up on when they see a grammatical error, that you're late to a meeting or don't respond to a phone call or seem a little scattered, they're going to assume that everything that, they, that you do will have that same kind of feeling to it. So a good salesman was able to create trust because they hit all the expectations very well. And uh, one of the nice things was that they could anticipate when to call. Um, they would basically call the prospect right when there was an actual need, when it passed through too early, when it called too late. So good salespeople were able to anticipate that call. And the biggest thing that a salesperson would do is position your product or service so that the prospect understood why yours was a better way than all their other choices that were out there. So buying was a form of trust. Um, Seth Godin, not sure if you uh, people know him. He's uh, one of my uh, role models. I follow uh, things. And he would say that you know, shopping, it was basically a, a, a risky exchange of money for something that you've never purchased before. It may be better than you hope, but it might not. You didn't know and you had to trust in order to give that money to somebody in the uh, hopes of getting what you were thinking it was going to be. So when we're managing salespeople, we would say, don't sell, help. Don't talk about your products or services. Uh, talk about the change that would happen for somebody when they use that, uh, that product or service. Talk about how that help has changed others. Um, what kinds of things would that, that uh, product or service be able to do for them? And make it interesting. Make it so that they would be able to understand it and tie it back to the marketing. 
So the salespeople will reach back to marketing and say, okay, I need this piece of uh, a presentation or this um, you know, white paper or article or so forth that would explain this story better and, and keep it through there. And one of the things that we wanted to do in sales and marketing is to understand that a customer, they may say that they have a need, but really they have an underlying need. So it's not that we're looking for a car, we're looking for a way to get from point A to point B, or that we may not need a sports car, but we want that feeling that we get when someone sees us driving that sports car. Or we may not need a, a, a drill, but we want the, a half inch hole. So in, in sales, the old school way of doing it, we always talked about how you needed to listen. You had two ears and one mouth, so you need to listen, 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 listen to the prospect, find out what that underlying need is, be able to relate to them on that need. I mean, a lot of FaceTime, uh, being able to talk to the prospects, meet with them face-to-face, -face, understand what their, their issues were, understand who they were as people, and really good salespeople, they were able to form those relationships. Marketing would find the people, sales would then make that a personal relationship. So what's happened in the last really decade but has elevated uh, since 2020? Technology, society, and therefore marketing is undergoing some unprecedented changes in a very short time. Uh, when we would forecast in the future where marketing and where the audience would be 10 years, 15 years from now, what's happened is that because of COVID and work from home and technology overall, that 10-year plan has reduced down to a two-year plan. And the biggest thing is that FaceTime has now become screen time. Uh, people are spending more and more time on their screens, communicating through their screens, as we're all very familiar with. Even now, when we're able to have face-to-face -face conversations and meet in person, there's a convenience with being able to work on your screen. And there's also a, um, a able ability to put a, a barrier there. When I'm on a screen, I don't have to feel the same kind of pressure as I would feel face-to-face. -face. So many people are finding that the screen allows them that safety net and such. We're also finding that it's causing great growth to happen. Um, instead of having to look for an encyclopedia to find information, you can go on the internet. It used to be that you had to go to your computer or go upstairs and plug everything in or turn it on, but now you can find it right on your mobile phone. It's very, very fast, uh, real-time, face-to-face video, AR, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, interactive live chat, all these things are happening and it's all happening online. And then there's big data, which is basically combining all of it together in delivering a very personalized message. Uh, so when I'm searching for something and when I'm talking to people, the uh, data machines are out there gathering all my information and then making sure that I'm getting presented the right information. So the new way to purchase, to buy, is to self-learn. Rather than listen to marketing messages or talk to a salesperson or sit down with them or do a face-to-face -face meeting or go test drive a car or so forth, we're going to go online and we're going to do our self-learning. We're going to find out what is out there. And really, we try to get as far through the process of understanding what we want and what kind of problems it solves and where those pain points are and all the things that the salesperson used to listen for. We're doing that exploration ourselves. So the big change is that the power has shifted. No longer is it the seller, the, the salesperson who controls access to information and controls the process for make, making the decision and getting things to you, but now it's the buyer. Um, and even in today's housing market where you know, sellers are able to sell houses in two or three minutes, it's that buyer that is able to find out where's the information and the real estate agent is able to, to expedite, it, but they're no longer controlling all the information of what houses are available and such. Okay. If I'm going too fast or if there's questions or so forth, please use the chat or the frequently asked questions at F and Q uh, on the screen and then we'll be able to get through them. Okay. So our big message is in today's world, how are you going to be trusted? If trust is what drives people to, to make a decision to purchase and you can't sit in front of the customer, how, do you, how are you going to become trusted? How are you going to show them that how you do one thing is how you do everything? How are you going to be able to present to them and, and know who to present to so that they will understand that hmm, I can trust what you're saying I understand, and you're somebody who I can believe in and I know how to reach you 
if everything is done online. Yeah. It's all led to a change in prospecting. Um, we no longer are using the yellow pages or even TV ads or such to generate an interest and to build a marketplace um, that way. Now, everything that was in that funnel, that sales and marketing funnel is all online. Um, direct mail is beginning to make some kind of comeback. Um, there's a little nostalgia for billboards and such, but really your entire sales and marketing process has to go online. And you need to be able to, to convert, to take every single step and have that online, have that available. One of the things that I'll ask clients is that, um, what is the one thing that they wish all prospects knew about them? The thing that they always make sure that they make a point of talking about when they meet face-to-face -face with the client. Uh, the one thing that you know, differentiates them from everybody else they're gonna meet. And then I'll ask them, where can that be found online? If you're not able to tell the person that, if you're not able to present it in your presentation or your, your brochure or your email, how are they going to find out that piece of information that really differentiates who you are? So we'll look at the traditional funnel. It's a awareness. Someone just became aware of who you are. They have an interest in your product. They investigate it. They then do an evaluation and a justification. To, from, and as they go through each one of these stages, they have a higher and higher intention to buy because they're spending more and more time. So in the traditional, on the right-hand side, it used to be billboards, cold calling, advertisements, direct mail, yellow pages, trade show seminars, infomercials. That was all the marketing that was happening, trying to find who the, uh, the prospects and who the leads are. So they would build the awareness of a problem and a solution. And then the person would request information or schedule a sales visit or do a trial and demo. And the salespeople would come in and be able to do all the things for the investigation and evaluation and justification and lead us through a sale. But now what's happening is that we have banner ads, event sponsorships, social media, um, ad advertisements or social media mentions, email marketing, video marketing. These are now the things that are building the awareness and the interest. And then once the person has become aware of a solution to whatever problem they may have, and they're interested in learning more, they go down to the search engines and through search engine marketing or organic search, they start looking at blogs and reviews. They go to how-to videos. They'll ask the social media on social media, does anybody have a recommendation? Has anyone used this before? How do people feel about this product? They'll get peer reviews, um, talking one-to-one -to, -one to their peers, word of mouth, referrals. One of the best things that Amazon ever did was making their uh, reviews and, uh, right available online so that people could see a product and see right below. You know, was it one star, five star? Most of us at the time in the marketing and sales world thought that was crazy that they would you know, not have that gated, um, just put it there for live. But it, it gave them an honesty and a transparency that made people feel much more comfortable about being able to purchase. That's now coming back around where there's paid professional referrers and uh, Amazon is now suing some of the review sites that are out there that people have, have figured out a way to gain. But overall, the concept of being able to find an honest review online is what we expect. And when we search for somebody and we, it's our product and we can't see a review, well, then we really start to wonder. See a question here about trusting reviews. Um, I think most of us have learned to read between the lines when we see a review. Um, if we only see five stars, that's a concern for us. If we only see one star, that's a concern. But if we see the majority of it is a 4.3 stars and it seems pretty honest what people are saying, then we'll, we'll feel comfortable about it. What's amazing is that today's marketplace, they want to trust themselves more than they will ever trust anyone else. So they trust their gut feel. They'll read something and just say, okay, that sounds realistic. That sounds, sounds right to me. You know, it's a, it's a feel good fact kind of thing. And once they read it, so forth, they'll trust the review as if it was their next door neighbor or their best friend telling them that that was something to, to go with. So first place that we start is to analyze who your top 10 clients are. Your best clients out there, the ones that you wish that you had a hundred of them. They are, uh, you know, what kind of problems did they have when they were first coming to you? 
Um, what kinds of things were they looking for? And how did they know? Oh, I'm sorry, I'll go back here. So someone is asking, where is the website on the funnel? Um, the website is all through here. It's it, basically your email marketing, video marketing, search engine marketing, organic search, all of that is going to the, to the website. And we'll talk about how that works. But these are all the methods of where people are. Nobody shows up at their website just because they happen to you know, stumble across you. They've come to your website because they did something um, through either email or through search marketing or somewhere or another, they found your website and came to you. This, the website has be, kind of become the salesperson with that's the keeper of all the information. Okay, so we'll analyze the top 10 clients. We'll look at what problems they had. Where were they when they realized that they had a problem? Um, may, that may mean their actual location or may mean where are they in their life? What kind of pivot points were they having? Um, what kind of solutions were they looking at, including the solution of doing nothing? So what are all the different solutions and why did they decide to become your client? What was the choice that they made? Um, so when they're making, you know, making their decisions, what kind of um, evaluations are they doing? What do they consider to be valuable information? And then what were their expectations when they purchased or started to use your service? And finally, what were the results that they got from them? So we look at all of these top 10 clients and say, all right, this is the type of information that we need to get out to the marketplace because that will attract more people who are like uh, these top 10. So when we look at uh, the psychology of a buyer, like what it takes in order for someone to make a decision to purchase, um, there's, they have to be able to overcome the pain of staying the same. So. You know, everyone will stay exactly where they are until the pain of staying there is greater than the pain of making a change. So the first thing is they have to realize, do I have a problem? You know, is there something out there that I want to change? Uh, and then is there a solution that's out there? Does that solution work? Can I afford it? And just because I can afford it, is it actually worth it? So they'll go through all of these five steps until uh, each one of these is good to know, a positive affirm affirmation before they'll decide to make a, a purchase. So we'll talk about for a, for a top 10 client, you know, what did they need to know in order to become a client? What was the information, whether it was the specific features and, and benefits of the, the product or service, or uh, what is it that they need to know in terms of being able to explain it to whoever the other decision makers are that they're with? Uh, when we talk about why, why do they care about you, you know, what is it that made you of interest to them? Um, it may, you know, we're not meeting people face to face any longer. So our company has a persona and what is that? And that persona has to be something that they actually care about. Um, so how do, how is that able to be expressed? What were the unique offerings we gave them? Who else influenced their decision? Um, whether that is an internal or an external influence. And then how do they get buy-in from the ultimate decision makers? Whether it is uh, if it's business to consumer, it could be their wife or spouse or, or if they, it was a business to business, it could be their boss, or it could be that the ultimate decision makers was society overall, their friends and family, and the judgments that they thought would be uh, happening for making that decision. So this is where a lot of small businesses get stuck, is trying to plan what the entire buyer's journey is. What they really want is, they just want the phone to ring, be able to say, yes, I have the product, here's what the cost is, and the person purchases it. But, Unfortunately, in today's world, we have to plan out the buyer's journey. And that takes us through the five steps, you know, the awareness, the interest, the investigation, the evaluation, the justification. So the, the awareness is, do I have a problem? And part of that first step is, is do, you know, being able to belong or be relevant. It's how we're perceived by others, keeping up with the Joneses, that whole thing. So. Um, if you, you know, if this person says, you know, I don't feel like I'm keeping up with everyone else, or I'm no longer relevant, or I don't belong, I don't fit in, um, I want to get there, that starts to drive that there's a problem, something needs to be changed. Another one may be that they want to be right, or at least not wrong. Uh, so they, you know, will buy the, um, you know, the electric car because it's, you know, right for the environment, or so forth. Uh, anything that fulfills the basic needs, health, wealth, relationships, happiness, you know, these are the, you know, I, I want to feel more energetic, I want to be ready for this next step, um, I'm ready to, you know, to move into a tight, better relationship, 
in order to be happy, I need to go on vacation. No, one of those basic needs to be fulfilled. Security, um, insurance, prevention, loss, warranties, all of these are, are ways to address security. And when people feel that there may be a loss going on or potential for a loss, then uh, you know, they'll, they'll make a decision to, to, to purchase some security, some way of protecting themselves. And the last one, which we're really seeing right now with the Generation X and, uh, and baby boomers, is memories, familiarity, the things that they used to have in the 80s and 90s or earlier, um, things that they trusted for years, um, different types of um, familiarity, such as doing a reorder, you know, make it as easy as possible to just order what I used to, what, what I've been having. Um, what kind of subscriptions are out there now? You know, so instead of making one grand purchase, Companies have shifted over to a subscription method because they know it's a lot easier for people to just renew that subscription than it is for them to go decide to buy the next model. And one of the things that we want to look at is where will these people be when they realize that they have a problem? You know, will they be on social media or driving in their car, listening to the radio, talking to their family? Uh, will, you know, will they be listening to a podcast? You know, where, where will they be when they start to realize, oh my God, there's, you know, there's some problem here that I, I'm worried about. Next step is the interest. Is there a solution? Um, so they may talk to the friends and family word of mouth. They may do a search. They'll do a frequently asked question on Reddit or Quora. And one of the things that uh, we're seeing right now is that the trust in Google is dropping considerably fast and people are adding Reddit or Quora to the end of their search so that they're only looking in those environments which they feel are more accurate, more authentic uh, than all of the spammy links that, that Google is giving them. They may reach out onto social media or look at YouTube videos or infomercials, um, TikTok and other things out there that they'll start to say, you know, how to solve this, how to fix this, you know, what to do when, those kind of questions. And then advertorials, uh, which is a, it's a, it's a paid content, but it's written in a way that it answers a question. It doesn't seem like an ad. It's more of an editorial type feeling to it. Okay. The next step is investigation. So trying to find out, does it work? Uh, and that may be using case studies, videos, samples, testimonials, demonstrations, all these different things that they want to do without having to actually engage with a person. Uh, they don't want to talk to a salesperson at this point. They still want to find, figure out, does this work? And does it fit my need? Does the solution really work for me? Then we get into the evaluation. Can I afford it? This is when they really start to talk to salespeople. First, they'll look online for price. Look, and then they'll want to talk directly to someone to find out, can I get a better price? Is there any quotes, any sale, or any coupons, any sales? any add-ons, packages, so forth, any way that I can get a smaller, uh, that I can get something special, unique for me, or they'll be looking for budgetary numbers. And that's when they'll be you know, really looking online to get an idea of what they should be paying and such. Um, there's a, a big trend happening that's saying that all your numbers, all your sales numbers should be available online unless there's customization, unless there's an installation that has to happen, uh, unless there is some luxury uh, feeling to it, so forth, where there's the, it's the experience of buying um, more than the actual product itself. Otherwise, put them, you know, put as much information as possible uh, online, and uh, this will help people get through this gate where they don't feel the pressure of, oh, I have to actually call somebody um, and, and talk to a salesperson. The last step was the, is it worth it? This is the value add, um, you know, what's the cost of just staying the same? Maybe it's too painful, too much money or too much time or too much energy to make that change. Um, then when you look at competitors out there at this point, a lot of times um, we'll get a call from somebody who will ask us, they know exactly what they want and so forth. And just looking for, you know, what's the price and time and delivery? Well, they're already at stage five. They've already gone through all the other stages with some other company, some other product. They're just bringing us in at the last moment to ask us a question, you know, to, to, to do a comparison shop. And unless, we're extremely um, price competitive or have some story, some unique value proposition that they never thought about, all we're doing is helping justify their purchase for another product when we talk with them. They may look at the strength and weaknesses of the product. I love doing SWOT analysis. It's the strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats for a company, for a product, for a category, for an audience. 
Um, when you're doing a purchase somewhere in your mind, even if it's for a candy bar, there's a strength and weakness uh, that you're doing uh, to compare, you know, whether you should make this purchase or not. They may look at the pain point, you know, is that pain point, what they thought, the reason why they were going to buy, is that really, truly there? Um, or was it something that was pushed on them or imagined or so forth? And the last thing is how simple. The simpler this, the uh, process is to make the purchase, the less time that they'll worry about, is it worth it or not? You know, if I'm looking to buy that candy bar, it's not going to break the bank if the candy bar is not really good um, or if it doesn't, doesn't taste the way I thought it was going to, it may be out a couple of dollars. And if I can pick it up right at the register or better yet, as Amazon does, I just put it in my bag and walk out and it automatically gets charged. That's a simple process. It takes less thought versus if I'm looking at my uh, life insurance policy, I'm not going to do a you know, simple, quick purchase on that. I'm going to really look into it because it's important and it shouldn't be that easy. In fact, if it was really easy, just sign on the dotted line. I'd really wonder on what I was getting. Okay, so this leads us to what is called the content strategy. So the content strategy is some way of communicating all this information for every stage of that sales funnel to the prospect. So we have to develop every piece on there and we have to do it in a way that tells what we want to say and how we want to say it in the place where they're going to be. So it may be a website post, it may be a video, it may be an advertorial, maybe a, a blog post, a guest blog, podcast, some other way. But we have to come up with creating this content and putting it in the places where people are going to be when they're reaching each one of the stages. And ideally what we'd like is, is when we engage them where they are, they all of a sudden have this like blinding awareness of the obvious. They go, oh my God, that makes so much sense. Oh, I want to look into that more. That's, you know, that's exactly what I was hoping to find. So when we're talking about different types of buyers, there's six types that we look at. The first one is the apathetic buyer. That's the one who they know exactly what they want, all they're doing is trying to, to do a price comparison or something like that. Save yourself the time, move on to someone who's more likely to buy. Um, so the person who's just sort of like, eh, you, know, you can tell all they're doing is running through the motions because they want to you know, be able to tell someone, oh, I looked at everybody out there and this is who I chose. And they already know who they want. That's not worth it. Uh, the self-actualizing buyer, they also know exactly what they want, but they want your product. They want, you know, they've, they've heard the marketing, they understand the value proposition. Don't try to talk them into anything that they haven't already set their, their mind and hearts on. They know what they want and they're, they're wonderful. Um, the analytical buyer, you know, this is somebody who is very, very task focused. They're going to look at every single thing that you have. They're going to um, really break it down and they want you to prove it. Um, the, you know, if you send an email that says something like, you know, we've been working with companies just like yours, they're going to want to know exactly who those companies were. Uh, and, they're, and if you're able to prove it, if you're able to show that you're being authentic, they will love you and they will become your best fan out there. Um, they're great clients because they have really worked, you know, they'll, they're focused on numbers and they'll be hundred percent sure on why they're making the decision. But you can't give them, a, can't give them any avenue of kind of, uh, <laughs> sorry, um, you know, of, of fluff or sales speak or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so there's a question here about how important are blogs or updates on a website? Do question, customers rely on them to complete purchases? So uh, again, one of the things uh, I mentioned was that how you do one thing is how you do everything. So if your website is out of date or has misinformation on there or doesn't match up to the other messages that they're getting, that tells them there's something there. It causes a little bit of friction in that decision process. So you want to always make sure that your website has the most accurate information. People will be going back to it. They'll be taking a look at it and they'll compare that information there with what they heard, either when they were talking to you or when they were talking to others or what they saw online or a video or so forth. It has to match up correctly with them. Um, if they find that there is a discrepancy, they'll take a look and figure out okay, what is the most recent information. Um, if it's just one review that says something a little different, like the zipper was hard to pull up, but on the website, it talks about the revision to the zipper uh, and how it is you know, easier than ever to, okay, they say, okay, good. You know, they, they've heard the issue and they've taken care of it. Um, 
So they'll, they'll listen to the website more likely than they will to uh, some random fact out there. But if the website just totally is off you know, and it's clear that it's out of date, doesn't have the latest information or is um, too general, um, you know, a lot, a lot of times people will say, you know, I want a website, just you know, take what I, I'm, I'm like these guys, just you know, make me a website just like this. Well, that's, that's not going to differentiate you. Um, and a lot of times people who don't know your business, when they're creating the content and putting it on there, it doesn't match up. It doesn't really sound authentic. It's not really who you are. And when you visit a website, you're like, okay, I see this, but I still don't understand why I should buy from these guys. Okay. Uh, back on track, uh, the relator buyer. So this is the person who's all about relationships. Um, they like to help. They like to be helped. They want to be liked. Um, they focus on you know, what's going to be you know, well accepted by other people. What can they tell the story about to, to their friends and family? So you want to build a relationship and give them you know, something relatable about, you know, it's more than just the product. It's, you know, here's the whole backstory behind it. Here's the whole information uh, on where it is so that they can, you know, feel comfortable and happy. And it's something that they're going to be able to express to others. Uh, any of your high luxury uh, brands, it, they're going to the relator uh, type thing. Uh, the driver, you know, that buyer is, they're direct, they're imp impatient, they're very concise. They get straight to the point because they're very busy, very preoccupied. If you try to tell them the whole backstory, they would dismiss you in a second and walk away. Uh, so you need to really look at who the buyers are and try to figure out which is the piece of information that they like and that they need to hear. And then the last one is a socialized buyer. Uh, this is somebody who's achievement oriented. Um, once you get to, uh, you know, to each step of that stage, put it on paper, get a copy to them immediately, take it to the next step. They're gonna go from A to B to C very, very cleanly, very easily. And, uh, and they'll, they'll basically follow your direction on where to go. All right, so as we're going from stranger to buyer, you may start with a search result, they know nothing about you. They come to your website, they see a white paper, they read that white paper more in depth about it, they start to learn more about you. They attend a webinar because they want to hear you know, firsthand. While they're still not being addressed one-to-one, -one, they're able to talk and, and hear, does this match up with everything I'm seeing online about them? They'll then ask for a quote or a guide where they can start to compare you to others, really see how it works. And then they become a buyer and fan, hopefully, um, where they make them place an order, do an appointment. So this is the, the path that normally would happen. And as you can see, the website is, is definitely part of this, um, but it's, it's not everything. You, know, you have to make sure that you know, your whole, it's a, it's a, a continuous transaction that's happening and, and uh, very, very uh, continuous. So, so one of the things we look at from a prospect qualification, so trying to get people um, qualified so that we can spend the time that we need to with the right people, we wanna make sure that there is a budget, that they have the authority to buy, that there's a true need, that they, there's some uh, idea of timing, some pressure, and understand what the impression is that they have of the company. It's what we call Banty. So we're looking for a Banty score. So the budget, we take this and we say, okay, um, on a scale of one to five, you know, where are they in terms of budget? They don't have an idea, they have no idea. They don't use budgets, they'll have to get approval. They have some kind of idea, but it's not realistic. They have a range that's realistic or they budgeted with a set amount approved, meaning that um, they've already got a budgetary quote and said, yes, we can afford to pay that. Okay. The authority, um, you know, what authority do they have to decide? Everything from gathering basic information to kind of working with decision makers or the part of a committee um, where you've met every member of the decision committee and have a relationship with them to there's a primary decision maker. There's one person and, and you have a good relationship. Because there's the need, um, they're just collecting info. They've been tasked to investigate. You know, there's a definite project, but the scope's really unknown. They don't know exactly what they're looking for, but they know that they're looking for something or they may have a project scope that's in process, it's still developing exactly what they want. And then five is that they have a, a full project scope. The timing is, it's uncertain, it's on the horizon, there's no set date. Um, project may start within the year, they're just starting to budget it, or they have an active project timeline uh, where they wanna have something delivered or installed or set up or done. And then the last is what's the gut feeling of their impression of you? 
of you as a company, you as a salesperson, um, you, know, you as a supplier. It's uncertain all the way up to you're my, you're my best friend, you're my sole supplier, my number one person to go with. So each one of these banties are set up with a score one to five. And what I do is I assign each stage a score of one of uh, four points. So one is four points, a two is eight points, a you know, three is 12 points, all the way up to 20 points. And when I uh, put them all together, if I got fives across the board, it'd be a hundred percent chance that we're gonna make the sale. And so this is how we'll do our prospecting scoring to figure out, you know, what stage are they at and where do we need to work? You know, do we need to work in the impression or do we need to put pressure on the timing? Um, is, our, is our pricing of value not uh, in range with them? You know, what's the best area to, to focus on? So we'll use a, a, a marketing plan to help connect all these pieces together to basically uh, educate the customer for each one of these so that by the time that we're talking with them, they have already figured out a general budget or range run thing, got an understanding for a lead time or how long it takes to get things in place. You know, they passed it on to whoever's the decision makers, pulling it all together. And the website is going to contain the overall message. So we wanna drive the message to the marker with what we call bridging strategies. So these are, um, if the website is the message, is the holder, we're creating a bridge from wherever people are to get them to the website. So we may do that through search and SEO and search engine marketing, through emails that we send out, social media, uh, advertisements, um, whether these are traditional banner ads or podcast ads or search engine ads, you know, different types of advertising out there, blogs, traditional uh, marketing and so forth. Okay. All right, so the website consideration. So. Take your website strategy, pivot from selling to helping, create these personalized ex experience and show the change that made a difference. Too many websites out there are just focused on product features and benefits. And really they need to start focusing more on the experience people will have. And then as you go further into the website, you'll get into the real details and meat of it. We wanna eliminate the gates, make the sale process as simple as, as possible, change the focus and tell a distinct story. You know, what's the change we created for others? and how that aligns with whoever the type of buyer is and what states that they're in. We wanna do it so that they, they don't have to work, that it becomes easy for them to get to that next stage. They wanna be able to reach you, make it easy to call. Um, I go onto a lot of sites, websites on my mobile phone. I see a phone number and I go to click on it. It doesn't go to call. In fact, I can't even copy and paste it to, to make a phone call. I have to remember it and then go to the phone. It's just because it was set up with either the image or however they coded it was wrong. We wanna simplify the forms so that it's, um, it kind of guides people more like a wizard rather than this long extensive form and ask them a thousand questions and definitely make sure it can be seen on, on a mobile phone on all the different devices out there. Chat is a big uh, thing coming in now where they have a chat bot. So the little thing of how, I, how can I help? Ask your question here. If you're gonna do something like that, make sure you answer. <laughs> Too often, um, you click on chat and we'll say, there's nobody here right now, let's send us an email. Um, or worse yet, ask your question and then there's no response. You also can create quick, frequently asked questions. Um, so these are pages of your website that have the questions that people are asking for. Most, something in the range of 60 to 70% of search is people asking a question. So if you want to be found in search better, have questions available on your, and answers on your site. We want to focus our target on the smallest viable audience. Um, so rather than trying to say, everybody is my customer, really narrow down to who are your top 10 customers, what type of audience is that, um, and, and define how you make a difference for those people. Focus on those you can help, those who want to help, who appreciate us for what we do. Um, and then one of the things that we say is, you know, who would miss us if we were gone? Meaning that if I wasn't able to offer this service any longer, what kind of client would miss us, would have no other choice or would have to really change how they do things because those are, you know, those are the ones who are raving fans. So people ask about search all the time is you know, how important is it and what do we need to do? Well, the yellow pages have converted to search. Yellow pages used to be our go-to for a small business for marketing. Now it's all search. Um, there's major changes in the ways people use search. They continually change um, how they're using search, whether it's voice search now, or um, trying to do a personalized search where 
you know, Google or so forth will understand what you're looking for based upon what your past search histories were. Search is constantly evolving because people evolve what, what they do. Um, the focus is also now on mobile and work from home. Uh, and Google has adopted the mobile first focus. So that means that when they scan your page, they scan it as it, how it looks when it's on a mobile device. Um, it used to be years ago that we would have two different websites, one website for mobile, one website for, um, for the desktop, because a mobile website should be simple and easy to use. But if Google's only looking at that mobile site, they're not picking up half of the three quarters of the information that they should be getting. So make sure you have a responsive site that adapts to mobile, not two different sites. Okay, so since every search or every journey now starts with search, it has a much broader scope, it can be very difficult to verify. Um, so you wanna use the tools that are out there, whether it's Google Analytics or Search, uh, search Console to be able to verify you know, how well are you appearing in search. And because of, of how Google and how search categories are doing, trying to, to dominate a category is almost impossible. Um, you now are looking at localization and, and personalization, all these different things. So someone says, oh, I can get you to the top of the list of Google. That's almost meaningless. Um, so you really have to look at where, where are you when you start? And as you do your SEO, your optimization, you know, where do you go to? So the biggest thing is yeah, if you want to write for search text, basically you want to write for the reader, but then it has to be readable by the search spiders. And uh, you know, the search spiders, you know, they, they take a look at your page and they try to understand what it's about. So the on-page SEO, that's how well these, these search engines can understand your website. It's worth about 25% of all the ranking variables, but it's the most important one because it's the very first one um, that, they, that they look at. Each page ideally should have one main topic so there may be subtopics that support the main topic, but if you try to put too many products and services on a page, you just have one page that's products and it's now lists 15 different products that you offer, you're not gonna achieve a very high search ranking for that. Um, the main topic should be have a keyword uh, and focused on there and each page should have a, a unique title to it. Imagine that you were walking into a, a library and every single book had the same page, home, products, services, about us, Con, you know, contact, you'd have no idea which, which book to pull out. So your page should have a unique title to it uh, so that Google is able to understand it very clearly. Long tail is when instead of just saying, I'm looking for a car, you describe the exact brand and make and model of the car and also where you're located so they can find it. So um, long tail helps you get more specific searches and it also improves the level of intent people have when they're looking for you. So I'm gonna get through here. So your perfectly optimized page, it has a headline, has a body text. It uses that search phrase over and over and over again throughout this. Um, so instead of just having a donuts page, this is a page about chocolate donuts and it really gets into the details uh, of, of the chocolate donuts. All right, social media. Um, social media is typically top of the funnel that you know, do I have a problem type situation? Until the addition of stores and e-commerce, now Facebook and Instagram and now some of the other uh, social media, be able to purchase things directly through there. So now social media is becoming more scattered throughout that funnel. Um, your business page needs to list the services, specials, testimonials, et cetera. Um, so really make sure your business page is fleshed out. And you wanna link um, to, to your website for every part of the sales funnel. So all your posts should, connect to the, the parts of the sales funnel and they should link to the website to direct people over to there. Um, the last thing is that if you post something on your, on your social media platform, you have to share it. When you post things as a company, it has a very low organic reach. It's only about 3% of your um, fans will actually see what is posted on their feed. But if you share it as a person, then everybody who your friends and family and, and so forth will see your information. Um, and they'll get a lot more into that in next week's uh, discussions. So we start looking at um, social media, local groups. Does anyone know referrals? That's probably the, one of the biggest things that's being used for, for local, um, for social media now. You want to use videos, um, YouTube, but also videos are being used on Twitter, on Instagram, because of TikTok. TikTok is becoming the largest uh, social media growth platform out there, especially for the younger. and I'll say 30 and 40 year olds as well. The email revival. Um, we used to say that email was dead, but now 
you can do things like personalization. Um, so you can create a template and in that template have uh, personalization things that your CRM or your uh, database will be able to drop in someone's first name and such. So that seems like a very personalized, very friendly email that's coming to somebody. Um, you can set up automation and drip campaigns. You know, if it takes uh, 10 times for somebody to really you know, reach and understand a marketing message, you can create 10 emails and have them automatically get sent out to someone. So that once they have contacted you once, then they'll now, um, you know, we'll get an email today, they'll get an email three days from now, five days after that, they'll get the next one, and so forth. So they're getting continually educated uh, over time. And you can apply these same concepts to Messenger, to SMS, um, text messaging, uh, and also the app notifications. I'll talk quickly about advertising because this is really the way that you expand your market. You know, when you're talking about email marketing and social media, that's, uh, you know, you already have some kind of connection to people, but you get into advertising, this is when you can really expand into different audiences. So the paid advertising, it's more immediate. Um, your goals can be measured very easily, but it's also a pay to play. So the minute that you stop paying, you've lost uh, all that avenue. Uh, I have some people who you know, their entire uh, marketing method was just doing pay-per-click. And as Google would change the pricing and the strategy and how it worked, their ability to, to grow their business would change drastically. Um, advertising is also for audience with known needs. Um, these are for people who are really already doing a search. They're already on stage three of the, of the sales funnel. Um, you're not going to get to that um, top of the funnel uh, with a, a, a Google ad very well. Social media ads, you can. Um, you know, and, and working with um, bloggers or um, other channels out there, podcasts, so forth, then you may be able to find people who are at a certain target and be able to reach them at the top of the funnel before they even realize that they have a problem. And then the keywords are less important with pay-per-click. Everyone always says, oh, which keywords am I going? It's more the search intent, I know. So you say, I'm going after somebody with this area and then allow Google and the uh, systems out there to basically figure out for you know, where they should be uh, putting the ads and, and even what type of ads to, you know, to, to create for you. Um, so smart ads for most small businesses, this is the way to go. Unless you're going to spend a thousand or two thousand dollars a month on advertising, smart ads just allow the Google AI to figure out, you know, what uh, what headline mixes with what text to get the best results out of it. What kind of keywords should it be going after and such? Um, when you start getting into higher volumes, you know, five hundred, a thousand dollars a month, two thousand dollars a month, then it starts to make sense to to spend some time. Um, really analyzing it, but anything less than that, it's gonna, it's, it's, it's almost fuel. Uh, advertising personalization. So this is where social media really comes in and some of the direct campaigns. Um, what this does is it will allow people to say, here's a list of people who are my favorite customers. Find me other people just like this. Um, or here's somebody who looked at my product uh, earlier send them more information about the product or um, they abandoned the cart or they were looking at, at uh, something similar to this, send them the ads. So it's where the um, advertising platform knows what the history is of somebody or knows who that person is, kind of creepy that way. Um, and you can say, I wanna find people who fit into the same audience uh, looks. It's getting a lot of feedback. There's what they call third-party data and uh, the cookie thing where you, know, you always have to now select that it's okay for people to track me on cookies and such. This is really changing the personalization and the advertising. We'll see where this ends up going to. When you advertise on social, you can build new audiences. Um, you can make sure that your entire audience actually gets your message. Um, you can specify your targeting with custom audiences, you know, people who look just like me or people who are my favorite customers. Um, you can go after influencers with product placements. So you can pay people to talk about your product or show your product that gives them that little feel that you know, your product has been accepted by somebody who is admired and you know, attractive and you know, everyone likes. So you know, they'll end up buying your product. And um, Facebook has it where they can um, do a Facebook ad that directly goes to Messenger and it has a very high conversion rate. So rather than just an ad showing on their Facebook feed, it pops up in the messenger as you know something, and it's like a text message coming in, and people respond to that much higher. Good or bad, 
don't know. Um, some people respond to it in a good way. Some people respond in a bad, but everybody responds to a, a text message or, a, or an, a messenger uh, message faster than they do from an ad that they happen to scroll through. Okay, so made it to 6.55, just in time. Sorry, I had to speed that up a little bit. Um, I have myself and I also have Jeff Seaver, my partner listed here. The reason why is that right now, um, I'm not taking on new clients all that often, uh, but Jeff, uh, who is my partner, he's focusing on the website and graphic designs and does score presentations just like I, and we work together all the time on many different projects. He is taking on new customers. Um, so if you are looking for someone to work with strategy and work on a website, and email marketing and all these types of things, um, please reach out to either one of us. We'd be happy to help with it. I did have a question here about drip campaigns on whether they're appreciated or do people get annoyed by the, um, you know, the, the drip campaigns coming in, being overpopulated. You, with a good program, you can set up how often a drip campaign happens and also what to do. So if somebody doesn't open your email campaign, then it could wait you know, a lot longer. If they open your email campaign and click on something, then they may get the next piece of information sooner. So um, the drip campaigns are really becoming smart and you have to test and measure continuously through it to, make, to see how it's going to work. And Beth, I'll turn this back over to you to talk about the next classes. Great, thank you, John. It was awesome. I really appreciate your uh, the way you evaluate a customer with that chart that you shared. It's something that I never actually thought about doing, but it's so it's so easy, and it puts your customer in perspective, so you know where to spin your wheels and where not to. So thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, again, I wanted to share. If you're enjoying what's going on in our Build Your Business workshop series, please go on our website. It's on the bottom of this. It's www.monroectchamber.com forward slash events. We have four more presentations. And next week is going to be Lorraine Duncan from Biz Gone Social. And she's going to be talking about social media, how it's just a piece of the marketing pie. So thank you very much, Bud. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. And, Actually, Bud, um, before we do, I see there's a couple of questions that I did not uh, hit. Let me just answer them quickly. Uh, one was regarding um, for something like consulting services, can a unique approach and justification be included in one brand story? Um, as long as you don't complicate it too much. Um, again, our audience has about a 30 second attention span. Um, one of the things that Seth Godin talks about is like, uh, you know, you want to basically, there, throw a monkey to, or throw a banana to a monkey. That's how they're gonna act. So you know, they'll see one, but they'll miss the whole bunch that's over there if you try to do too many of them. So it's, uh, you really wanna you know, keep it really focused, really simple. And if your story is easy enough to explain, then yes, you can combine it together, but otherwise you wanna drip, you know, spoon feed them uh, one bit at a time. Okay. okay. Great, thank um, you. I'm going, well, first of all, thank you, John. Uh, very nicely done, very comprehensive. I wanted to remind everyone that a recording of this webinar and the materials are going to be available within a couple of days at the fairfieldcounty.score.org website. And that our next live webinar will be Tuesday, March 1st at noon. The topic is going to be win customers with your website. Jessica Baldwin will be presenting. And again, a reminder, SCORE offers free individual counseling. So please use the link on the screen or visit our website and click request a mentor. Also, please fill out your evaluations that have been sent to you at the end of this webinar. And finally, on behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's event. And in closing, a big thank you to John Dupree. Stay well, everyone, and um, have a nice evening. Thank you. Have a nice evening, everyone.